Uh, again, I'm Dave Scudis. I, I'm a civil engineer by training and I work as the director for design, construction and maintenance at the Mile High Flood District. Uh, I work with a staff of around two dozen to implement around $75 million worth of infrastructure and maintenance projects each year. So that keeps us pretty busy. Uh, for those that are unfamiliar, we are a special district that encompasses the greater Metro Denver area. So we're not county or state. Our funding comes from a mill levy on property taxes. And we facilitate the rhyme and reason to how our urban waterways are managed as they cross 40 city and county boundaries along around 3,500 miles of major drainage ways. We work on floodplain mapping, master planning, flood warning systems, capital construction, and maintenance. We also work with our local governments on land development. Uh, this, uh, this black area is on this map. Uh, here are all the yet to be developed parcels. This is where we have the chance to avoid creating some of the problems from past land use and infrastructure decisions, which is the focus of this talk. We wanna avoid situations like this where neighborhoods were built where they shouldn't have. Uh, we get flood risk that looks like this, uh, which then looks like this when it comes to fruition, like it did in 2013. I, I like to tell people my job is to keep floods outdoors, and this is why. Uh, mitigating for this type of flood risk is quite the burden for taxpayers and the people living there. In, in our land use and infrastructure decisions, they're generally intended to make our communities better, uh, but they can actually commit, make our communities worse off if we're too short-sighted or too narrow in our thinking. And I've basically made a 20-year career out of building capital improvement projects to mitigate for land use decisions and to address failing or undersized infrastructure. Projects like this one uh, along Wonderland Creek. It took 10 years and cost $30 million. Or this one along the Hoffman Drainage Way, it was 20 years, $8 million. Uh, or this retrofit storm drain, 15 years, $10 million to stick a pipe in the ground and bury it. Now, mitigation projects are messy and, exp and expensive in every way you can imagine. And so, Developers, they may pay to install public infrastructure, but the local governments, we generally inherit it. And think about all of the, the pavement, the water lines, the sewer lines, the parks, you know, the list goes on. And the same thing goes for projects funded by the feds. They may help us build infrastructure, but they aren't really around to help us maintain it. Now, I'm not personally aware of any federal grants for infrastructure maintenance. And so our, our cities often develop in ways that are really inefficient from a long-term maintenance standpoint. So when all that shiny new infrastructure falls apart, there may not be enough local government funding to repair it or in some cases replace it. And so taxes generated from certain types of land use may not create enough revenue for the local community to someday pay for replacing the infrastructure supporting that land use. So perhaps a community does take in some additional taxes from new developments and maybe there are even impact fees. But what if those funding inputs aren't enough to pay for the deferred maintenance or replacements, you know, the costs? It starts looking like credit card debt, which in many ways it is because the cost of maintenance and replacement goes up over time, kind of like paying interest on your credit card. A specific example of this happened in Omaha, Nebraska, where the city inherited a number of developer constructed roads, some of which were substandard. And the city eventually ran into a, a shortage of funds for their citywide pavement maintenance program. And in some locations, the city was actually forced to pulverize some of the failing roads, essentially converting them into dirt roads. And, and as you can imagine, that wasn't a popular outcome for residents like this fellow. I think he chose the wrong day to wear white sneakers, which is probably every day when you live on that particular road. And the more structural a piece of infrastructure is, the more expensive it will be to someday replace. In Denver, a glaring example is the, the Central 70 project. So several miles of I-70 were built as a viaduct back in the 1960s, and they must not have had the land to do anything simpler or less structural at the time because of the narrow corridor. So now we have this massive project to reconstruct this entire section of interstate, to widen it and lower it, and to place a lid over the top of sections of it. So it's evolved into this $1 billion, with a B, 
dollar project. It's very political, lots of riot picketing and, and very uh, energetic public meetings. And while we could argue the merits of the design approach, what can't be argued is that the old viaduct was in disrepair and needed replacement. It, it only lasted around 50 years and its condition was way past being an issue of maintenance. It's now another capital project on the same stretch of road 50 years later because of prior land use and infrastructure decisions that led to this outcome. So it's important to think long-term about land use and infrastructure decisions we're making today because they tend to be pretty permanent. Our decisions outlast us and they get handed down to our professional successors. So long-term thinking, and I think this plays into some of the conversation you guys were just having, is why in Denver, we map floodplains using future land use conditions for our hydrolog hydrology because we know that developing land will increase runoff and we don't want to remap floodplains every time a parcel develops. Uh, we're a cooperating technical partner with FEMA and they allow us to do this as a regulatory tool uh, as long as the future developed flows are no more than 30% greater than existing hydrology. That's something we do here. So we map the floodplains with the future in mind. We also spend a fair amount of time trying to change mental models. This is a hard thing to do. Uh, so what are mental models? Mental models are the assumptions, generalizations, and other filters that underline how we interpret situations we come across. So our interpretation helps shape our response or action. So if I say the word dog, most of you will have an idea, a feeling, or a picture that enters your brain. And that's your mental model of a dog. Well, when I think of a dog, I think of my cute little fur baby, Rosie. Uh, there she is. Uh, so a positive mental model. Uh, conversely, I have a friend who, who hates dogs. And that's because she grew up in a tough neighborhood with lots of guard dogs. She had to walk past to get to school. So this is her mental model of a dog, which is quite different than mine, of course, but founded on her experience. Well, in, in my work, I often interact with open space folks and some open space professionals, when they hear the term flood control, this is their mental model. Uh, and maybe that's the mental model for some of you. There's no judgment here, okay? And I can't say I blame you. Engineers like me built these projects uh, because they move a heck of a lot of water. But here is a side-by-side -side contrast of this same creek on the same day within a mile showing how much different we build flood control today, at least in Denver. These are the same creek on the same day. I flew these with my drone, it was kind of fun. Uh, but the mental model of the imagery on the, on the left explains why some communities don't allow new developments to count any of the floodplain towards their open space credit. So if drainage ways look like a box culvert uh, without a lid on it, I, I get it, that doesn't really look like open space. But clearly our modern design approach can be an asset to open space. Here we're making infrastructure that looks like nature. And what's better for open space than a healthy flowing stream, especially in the middle of a city? So it's a problem when a developer can't count any of this wider floodplain. This is the same creek that I was showing you in that video. Uh, so it's a problem when the developer can't count any of the wider floodplain on the right towards their open space credit. It makes them resistant to a natural design approach because it takes more space, they end up losing lots. So here we have code based on an outdated mental model, at least in Denver, and, and this is why it, it's also important to think beyond your own expertise or department. And since I'm talking to folks out of state, I gotta say go Broncos. We had a good once when Peyton was there. It's been a while. Uh, so if, if we want uh, better outcomes, then we need to embrace inclusion. So if we, if we only know about one little niche of a complex city government or government agency, then it stands to reason we'll achieve better outcomes if we recruit people from other departments or disciplines. So, so let's say that uh, this is a city government and you've got parks and public works and planning and you've got police and social services, finance, legal. So in the example I just shared, if development code is being updated, then it needs to be an inclusive process, uh, but inclusion, it works both ways. So for engineers like me, we don't, I don't typically dabble with writing land use code, but if an opportunity per to participate comes up then I need to pony up and help, but and the higher the stakes of your project, the more impactful it will be, the more inclusion you need to plan on having, but inclusion 
can be really important in small things too. So as an example, uh, there was a, a planning department for a local community at, that required developers to plant trees in landscape medians. And trees are great, I like trees, uh, but here's what would happen. When they got too large, right-of-way maintenance crews would cut them all down because they interfered with maintenance. You know, and this is one of those times where different groups within the city should probably talk. Uh, when it comes to medians, do we want beautification or maintenance? Could we maybe pick some smaller trees and have both? Sometimes we can have both. Uh, and I was uh, I was part of a, the design team for the Wonderland Creek I mentioned earlier. And one thing I'm happy we did as a design team was we we asked maintenance staff who plow snow along the trails for input on the design. We we have to plow the trails here in Colorado because of the snow, and some of them get treated as as nicely as the roads do, depending on the trail. Uh, so this was a brand new stretch of regional trail, and so we asked how could we adjust the trail, the railings, the walls to make plowing easier. You know, it's got these equipment. Like, how big is your equipment? Is it on a truck? Is it on an ATV? How big is your blade? These sorts of questions. Uh, the changes ended up being a few feet here and there and didn't really cost much, much extra, but it created more long-term value because we thought to ask. And so uh, asking for input for maintenance staff is easy to do, but it's also easy not to do, right? And so it takes intention and forethought. Okay, we also uh, should consider the full life cycle cost of our infrastructure. Uh, one of the services we provide at the Mile High Flood District is long-term maintenance of our urban waterways. And we've been around for over 50 years and we've learned a lot about life cycle costs because we get to deal with our own prior infrastructure decisions and the consequences of whether those were good ones or not. And so I, uh, I did a financial analysis recently of some sites around the metro area. And this, this gets back to the issue I brought up earlier. I wanted to know, will the revenue generated from the adjacent land use pay to maintain the infrastructure serving it? And so let's look at a few examples that attempt to answer this question. These are really short and sweet. Uh, so here we're looking at a stream called Lena Gulch and to allow for more property to de be developed, the stream was shoved into this rectangular concrete channel section. So, so yeah, that's technically a creek. Uh, the channel was built this way to allow for a few extra commercial buildings that you see here. I looked into how much this property is worth and with a little math, was able to figure out that we get around $400 in revenue from this property each year. I looked at what it would cost to fully replace all of the concrete someday and I don't want, I'd ask you guys to take some guesses, but you'll never guess. It, it would take 17,000 years for us to build up enough funding from the revenue from this property to pay to replace the channel infrastructure that was put there in this way really to benefit how that land developed. And I'm not making that up, I did the math myself. Well, let's look at a couple other locations because it's not always quite that bad. Uh, here we're at the Maxwell Tributary. It's, it's a concrete line channel that sits in the street median and it's quite undersized, so the road is used for conveyance here. The real estate in the watershed uh, adjacent to the channel is worth over $200 million, which allows us to collect around $10,000 a year. So if we just replace the channel lining and exclude all the culverts like you see here, it would still take us over 600 years to build up enough funding from this neighborhood to pay for the replacement. In the meantime, we patch it when it breaks and hope it holds together. At this final location along Newland Gulch, we are in a more open channel, but it's still fairly trapezoidal and with some really large grade control structures. I mean, look at how big that thing is, all that rock compared to the houses on the right or that, that playing field on the left. Now the property in this watershed adjacent to the creek is worth over $760 million, allowing us to collect around $38,000 a year. And it would still take us uh, over 300 years to build up the funding to replace the 25 grade control structures in this part of the stream. I hope they last 300 years, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't bet on it. So what we find is that much of our ability to create longer lasting, more resilient, lower maintenance, 
stream infrastructure rests on the amount of land we have to work with. In this aerial comparison, it shows how stark this contrast can be. These images were taken from the exact same altitude for streams that convey a similar amount of water. So when land use decisions uh, force us to confine our streams, you know, the water flows faster and deeper, putting more stress on the bed and banks. And this explains the history of building concrete line channels around the country. The concrete is necessary to withstand the depth and velocity of flow caused by the confinement. And you know, you think of how the water speeds up on your garden hose when you stick your thumb over the end. And the same principle applies here. You shrink the area, the water moves faster. Now, this sort of design is actually pretty low maintenance until one day when it's not, just like with the Central 70 project, when infrastructure like this someday falls apart, it's really expensive and can be awkward to maintain or replace. I found this photo on the internet somewhere and I saved it for just this occasion. I just, I don't know how they're gonna get to the rest of it. I got I figure they gotta wait for that part underneath them to cure and then they'll get to those, those gaps in between, I don't know. There's a story there and I need to know it, I don't know it. Uh, okay, so then uh, when we open the, the banks up a bit, whoops, we need less rock and concrete, but in this photo, we're, we're still looking quite structural and structures like this are prone to failure. This is an example where a big sinkhole formed under a structure like that. On this next one, we're doing a little better. You start to see less structure, more green. And then on this last photo, along Westerly Creek, this is, this is more of the ideal situation where we've given the stream plenty of room and we don't need to import nearly as much rock and concrete. And interestingly, this is an engineered channel that used to sit under the runways of the old Stapleton Airport. You know, sometimes we don't have the room to do this, but this is the ideal. With space for flood flows to spread out, resilience is achieved with healthy vegetation instead of a bunch of rock or concrete. And it looks like open space, bonus. So here's a, but how does it hold up to floods? Does this hold up? Do we have to go out and maintain this every time we get a big flood? Well, here's a photo of the same creek, a little further downstream, and keep an eye on that bridge. Here is the exact same view at the height of the 2013 flood we had. So this was definitely a 100 year plus flood on this creek. This next photo is of the very next day, and then back to the first photo, which was actually taken eight months after the flood. So there was nothing to fix here, just some debris to clean up, you know, no uh, search and rescue helicopters or anything like that even. It was, it was a spectator event. A person took the photo of that flood from a, a bridge on a nearby road. So long-term maintenance here involves weed whackers and trash bags rather than heavy earth moving equipment because there really isn't anything to fix. So we get to play the role of urban gardeners. And green infrastructure like this gets stronger over, the, over time as the vegetation matures, whereas gray infrastructure is strongest the day it's installed and gets weaker every day after. In the future, uh, we wanna influence land use patterns further out into the watershed. We don't wanna just deal with the increase in runoff all in the receiving stream. We think we could avoid these expensive stream restoration projects altogether if the land were developed in a way that avoids increasing runoff. These old school approaches cut off all these smaller first order tributaries, turning them into gray curb gutter and storm drains. And so if you, sh if you were to shift, you know, sometimes traditional site planning is just because it's easier and everybody's used to it. You can get an approval, you can deal with your MS4 or whatever sort of permits. But if you were to shift from a traditional site plan like this to that, that, that kind of starts with the road network and, and plans around the road network first and foremost. Switching that to the one on the right, which is a dendritic or tree-like one where you honor the, the natural topography a little better, we, we could reduce or almost eliminate the increase in runoff caused by development. We actually did the math and the, the site layout on the right actually yields a similar number of lots to the layout on the left. And we did the math, it uh, reduces runoff in, the stream could potentially be left in its natural state and not just erode like crazy because of urbanization. But here's the thing, at, at the flood district, uh, we can like this idea all we want, but we need to seek feedback from our initial pilot projects and be ready to course correct. Uh, we need to have a sense of inclusion because changing traditional site planning needs to work for developers 
planners and even the market for potential home buyers. You know, will they like it? And we need to ponder what this layout means for long-term upkeep and maintenance. Will it age well? Uh, so just a couple other quick hitters before I close, I'm, all, I'm almost done here, is uh, one helpful tool we use in Denver is that we define a major drainage way as having a tributary of 130 acres or more. Well, why is that? Well, it's because someone did the math and, and figured out this is the threshold where typical pipe and gutter flow criteria gets exceeded in the major storm. And so at greater than 130 acres, we require open channel because it's better and safer and more functional infrastructure. We also uh, map something we call a stream management corridor because a stream isn't a line, it's a corridor. I heard that quote somewhere and it stuck with me. And so this is a management tool for working with new development primarily, uh, but we pretty much mapped every drainage way in the district. The simplest version It's, it's, it gets interesting with them sometimes, I'll just say that. Uh, we've also coined a new term called high functioning and low maintenance streams or HEFLMs. If we could think of a better acronym, we would, but that's what we got. Uh, this is a philosophy that informs our approach to urban stream design. And so with, with hydrology, uh, we look for runoff reduction wherever we can get it, even at the site scale. Uh, we design for the hydraulics needed to keep people safe. We consider the geomorphology to see what a sustainable naturalized channel could look like. And we incorporate site-specific vegetation and community values to provide function for the 99% of the time when there is no flood. And we even have a local engineer writing a doctoral dissertation about this approach. So we'll see where he gets with that. But ideally, it looks like the photo on the right there, like God created that stream instead of it actually being an engineered channel within a corridor will be preserved as land developed around it. You know, achieving this sort of outcome takes a fair amount of inclusion and planning for it early as the site is being laid out. We want this corridor preservation predictable for developers because they're not fond of surprises as it were. Uh, we apply this philosophy on mitigation projects too. Uh, you know, the idea is to get as much function as we can get out of a site, given the context and site constraints we're working with. And so it's hard to argue this isn't an improvement upon this, you know. Uh, on, this, uh, on this next one, we got really creative and used a, a naturalized channel for frequent storms on top and then a buried box culvert for flood conveyance underneath that gets rarely used. It's, it's kind of, like, we like to call it a drainage mullet. It's a uh, function on top and conveyance on bottom. And uh, lastly, I, I hope you've enjoyed this deep dive into the Mile High Flood District's approach to land use and infrastructure. And uh, with a shameless bit of self-promotion, I'll tell you, I wrote a book about why it matters to be a good client in the construction industry. And it's full of anecdotes about working in water. So if you're ever looking for a keynote to bring in for a conference, let's talk. So thank you for having me. I'll be around for questions if you have time. David, thank you so much for the presentation. Great, great slides. Um, questions from the committee? Well, I'll just say thanks. Questions. Come on, you guys got to have questions. Well, this is Suzanne. I'll just say that was just an incredible presentation. And I know that, um, you know, we've done, uh, obviously, we've done some of that here, uh, the River Authority has done some of that here in, in San Antonio, but uh, I do think that you've brought up a lot of good points uh, going forward. Uh, and I really appreciate uh, Debbie bringing you to, to us today to show us these techniques that you've used. So thank you, it was very interesting. Yeah, thanks for having me. We don't have it all figured out, but we're trying to get there. <laughs>